All right, here we go. Moving on with this first caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please uh, uh, tell us what's on your mind. Hello, Rabbi Tobia Singer. My question is, do you think Paul was really a Jew, or do you think that he was, you know, a Greek or a Roman who was impersonating a Jew? And I ask this because he just misquotes Jewish scriptures, and he just has very little understanding of the Torah, and he misconstrues stuff. So do you really think he was Jewish? Thank you. Bye. Awesome. <laughs> Very good. All right. Robert, go ahead and take it away. As it turns out, Paul does not make the claim that he was a Roman, meaning a Roman citizen, although that claim is made in the book of Acts twice. Whether that's actually true, I don't know. I think Paul was Jewish, but he was not a Pharisee. It's very transparent that he was a Hellenized Jew. What's very transparent is that Paul is not only not a Pharisee, but the ideas that the Purusha, meaning the Orthodox Jews of his time, held was in sharp contrast with Paul. It's not that just Paul wrote in Greek, he thought in Greek, that's what's key. Paul didn't quote the Jewish scriptures properly. He's often assigned to being a to being some Pharisaic rabbinic scholar. Now he certainly will <laughs> <laughs> he will surely want people to believe that he is. Paul was never slow to make sure that everybody knew that he was a a chief Pharisee of Pharisees, Galatians 1, Philippians 3. He was also one of these personalities that got along with very few people. John Mark, he wouldn't travel with them. He just was at odds. He thought Peter was the biggest hypocrite, Galatians 2. But his worldview was very Greek. The Greek mind was dualistic. There's the spiritual essence, and then there's the physical world. And the physical world was essentially a wretched place. This kind of thinking would seep into many different movements during this time. Obviously, you can hear the Gnostics, but in fact, Augustine, before he became a Christian, belonged to a, a religious belief that was promoted exactly these ideas. This was like pervasive stuff in that the physical world was basically a— uh, the physical world was something wretched, the physical body was worthless, and it was simply the spiritual body and the spiritual essence that one is looking to achieve and that the law should only be spiritually bring us to a higher level. You can see that famously all over the place, Romans 7. Paul's obsession with conveying that Jesus rose from the dead, that's a very big part of his theology. Jesus was crucified, and he rose after three days. According to the Scripture, there is no such Scripture. Completely makes it up. You think he would, like, quote the Scripture, at least misquote it the way Matthew does? He just says, according to the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15. But then takes an inordinate amount of time to convey to his readers in this time in, in Corinth, in Greece, that the resurrected Jesus had nothing to do with the Jesus that walked on the earth. He was a now a spiritual being. In fact, what happens to the resurrected soul is one of a completely spiritual essence, not a physical one. Paul makes that akin to like a seed that's put in the ground. In his view, the seed died, and what emerges from that seed is something entirely different. And he refers to Jesus' resurrected body as a spiritual body. This is a very important chapter in 1 Corinthians 15. This is Greek. This is, this is the way Cicero thought. This is the way Socrates thought. Socrates was so happy to commit suicide. He was so at peace when he drank the hemlock that he was going to finally be done with this wretched body. Moreover, although the Greeks respected Jews and Judaism in a sense, they because of many reasons, our antiquity, our relationship with Alexander the Great, they could not wrap their brain around why the Jews would ever hope for a physical resurrection. To them, this was 
just an abominable part of the Jewish faith, Tchias HaMesim, a core tenant of the Jewish faith, the physical resurrection. Isaiah refers to the grave as a temporary dwelling place. People who are there are sheikh ne'afar, those just temporary dwellers in the ground, Isaiah 26, verse 19. It was, and the physical body is a holy thing, is a sacred thing. And the physical resurrection is very important. Now, what happened was the oddest thing is that although Paul, so influential, and he really wins the day as the most important, we're going to call it a convert to Christianity. He probably would not have used that term about himself, at least from the New Testament, it doesn't appear that way. We're just going to use conventional terms. Although Paul would win the day, his opponents, we would probably refer to as Ebionites, people from the Jerusalem church, the church that James headed, they lost Paul's influence that no one had to keep the law. The, the ritual laws was, was just a, been made a curse for us. And it's a mistake to think that he was just speaking to Gentiles about that. He was speaking to Jews as well, not, used, not often, but he does. Romans 7, a famous example of that. But that part of Paul's message, the 1 Corinthians 15 one, that whatever resurrects is something totally different. The view that people held was that the, the physical body was wretched. Why would you want to go back to that? But as it turns out, the traditional Jewish view won out among early Christians. And we see that rolling back in the gospel. So in Mark, written about 70, Matthew, Luke, around 85, John, about 10 years after Matthew and Luke, we see it the church moving in the other direction and, and moving back to a traditional view of the resurrection and that Jesus, in fact, physically resurrected. And almost each gospel writer seeks to outdo his predecessor in how physical it is. Famously, Luke has Jesus' appearance, the resurrection appearance, in Jerusalem where he's eating burnt fish. And the point is made, does a spirit eat and drink as I do? I mean, that's a polemic. That's pushing back against Paul with Thomas physically touching the holes in the hands of Jesus. So that's all a pushback against it. So the church would move to Paul in almost all areas, but in that one area, it doesn't. But what is germane to this question is that Paul's thinking was entirely Greek. Uh, Cicero, in Cicero's Republic, Volume 6, Paul was a Hellenized Jew, but he was whatever he needed to be to whoever he needed to be. He was very chameleon. If you think I'm making that up because I'm, I just, I'm being disparaging of Paul, I'm not. Paul advertises this technique in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 and 20, to the Jew, I come as a Jew that I may gain the Jews. To those who are not under the law, I become as one who is not under the law. I can become all things to all men that I may gain some. That's the way Paul worked. I mean, he's advertising this. Paul's way of, of spiritualizing very clear mitzvot in the Torah a mitzvah in Deuteronomy, if you have an ox that's threshing for you, oxen love what they thresh. They love the, the stuff they're working in when they're pulling a plow. And there are many, many commandments in the Torah that prohibit causing undue suffering to an animal. Many commandments. This is one. And the Torah says, four words, when your ox is threshing, you can't put a muzzle on the ox. You have to let the ox eat. Oh, leave it to Paul. In the same chapter, just 10 verses earlier, he spiritualizes that. And I use the word spiritualize with italics and quotation marks because spiritual is like a nice word, and I don't mean it nicely. He, he says, do you think that God cares about oxen? Do you, do you, could you imagine? So this is this is a real uh, Hellenistic way of thinking that that really the physical commandments don't have to be carried out. Just the what is the meaning behind it, and that's all that matters. Same thing we find in First Corinthians eight when he's asked, "Is it permissible to eat his?" Again, these are his Greek converts uh, from in Corinth. 
he's, he has asked a very good question. Can we eat from the meat that was offered to idols? And someone brings a, a cow for a sacrifice to Zeus, to Jupiter, or can you then eat of that meat? Now, that is usr. That's absolutely forbidden to a Jew or non-Jew. Even in Acts 15, where you have the ecumenical council, where Christians are asking, do we have to be circumcised? Do we have to keep the law? And what is resolved among the leaders of the church at this first ecumenical council is that you can't eat the flesh of animals that was offered to sacrifices. But Paul says strikingly the exact opposite. In 1 Corinthians 8, he says, look, I'm paraphrasing it, but if, if you know that these gods are nothing and therefore the, then it doesn't matter, it only was you know it's not really true and you know it's a fake. I know you went to college, you were told that Paul was a, a learned Pharisee steeped in the traditions of of the rabbis. You're told that Paul makes that claim. It's a complete lie. He quotes Greek poets who worship Zeus in Acts 17, 28. In 1 Corinthians 15, which we talked about, he quotes Menander, a comedy playwright. Menander was, he, he was just a, a filthy mouth. I mean, in his day, he was quite popular, but I mean, could you imagine? I mean, this was supposed to be the Word of God. Would God quote Mark Twain? Really? Because what we see that comes through in the letters of Paul very, very clearly, and it's very easy to read Paul and get it, what's behind it, because Paul's letters, especially those that are indisputed, are just very um, consistent, and the author just comes through everywhere. The Gospels are a little bit more difficult because they're overlays and overlays with multiple sources. Mark is using sources. Matthew and Luke are all using Mark and another source. So those are very—you have to peel away and unpack to try to get back to it. But Paulie, that task is completely unnecessary. And you see this character over and over again throughout history. If you are a student of history, one of the things that hit you in the face is that it's the same characters come up over and over again. Today, universities are filled with professors who know the texts in the Jewish Bible, but their understanding of it, or rather the way they convey it, is one that is so utterly hostile to the meaning and the intent of the author. And that's what comes through with Paul. He's a very real person. He was Jewish. The claim that he was from Tarsus, Paul doesn't make that claim. Acts makes that claim. People often conflate Acts with the writings of Paul. And the claim that he was a Roman citizen is a very serious matter. That claim is made by Acts. Paul doesn't make that claim. And therefore, I think he's Jewish, but a completely Hellenized Jew, who, like today, many people who are just completely assimilated Jews, but have studied a very familiar with Jewish texts. Thank you for that question. Adon Olam, asher malach, v'terem kum.